This episode of Timeless Leadership was recorded live on Twitter Spaces. If you'd like to participate and ask questions of our interviewees, just follow me, Scott Monty, on Twitter and watch for our weekly spaces. It seems like we hear about growth constantly. The growth mindset, growth marketers, even chief growth officers. William S. Burroughs, in 1953 in his novel Junkie Confessions of an Unredeemed Drug Addict, wrote, When you stop growing, you start dying. And that idea of juxtaposing growth and death, or growth and the stoppage of growth, was also reflected in the wisdom of longtime college football coach Lou Holtz, who said, In this world, you're either growing or you're dying. So get in motion and grow. Well, a leader's job is to grow the company, not just the bottom line. Certainly shareholders want to see growth in market share, in profitability, in stock price. But in order for a company to grow like that financially, its employees need to grow as well. They need to be developing skills that keep them current with industry changes But more importantly, they need to be growing as individuals. But why is individual growth so important? And how do leaders help individuals grow? And more importantly, how does that reflect on a leader's own ability to grow? These are some of the questions ahead that we're exploring with our guest, John Ferrara. Have you ever admired a leader and wondered just what it is that makes her who she is? How he came to embrace the things that advanced him? Welcome to Timeless Leadership, where we look at the principles that define success. This is a show for leaders at all stages of their careers who aspire to understand what it truly means to be a leader. And who is a leader? Dolly Parton said, If your actions inspire others to dream more, learn more, do more, and become more, you are a leader. Together, we'll explore key principles, not only in the sense of fundamentals, but also in the ethical sense, the habits, character traits, and virtues that form the backbone of leadership. Principles that are just as relevant and essential in the 21st century as they were in the 1st century. This is Timeless Leadership. Well, hi there, and welcome to another space around timeless leadership, where we explore principles and virtues of great leaders. Thanks so much for taking some time out of your schedule today and spending with us, and it's my hope that we provide the kind of quality of conversation that keeps you coming back. We do these shows live every week here on Twitter Spaces, and then we package them up as a podcast for listening later. So if you can't stick around for the whole thing, don't worry about it. But if you are here, you'll have the opportunity to participate in the conversation, to either uh, contribute some of your own knowledge, to ask questions of our guest, or what have you. And feel free to listen and to follow Timeless Leadership wherever you get your podcasts. And if you're not yet subscribed to the Timeless and Timely newsletter, just click on the link in my bio there, and it'll take you right to the site. John Ferrara is a serial entrepreneur and noted speaker about social sales and marketing. He's reimagined CRM by building Nimble, the simple CRM for Microsoft 365 and Google Workspace. John is best known as the co-founder of Goldmine Software Corp., one of the early pioneers in customer relationship management, that's CRM, for small to medium-sized businesses. He's been recognized by Forbes as one of the top 10 social CMOs, top 10 social salespeople in the world, and top 10 marketing influencers. John, welcome to Timeless Leadership. Scott, thanks so much for giving me the opportunity to join you and this wonderful podcast that you've built, um, I, I not only love listening to your voice, but I love listening to the words that you craft because you are so good at 
telling stories and inspiring and educating others. And I think that's why we're on this planet is to grow by helping other people grow. And, and you're one of the people that I admire that do that so well. Well, thank you, John. That's awfully kind of you to say, and um, I'll make sure that the uh, the check clears for you, so don't worry about that. <laughs> um, well, you, you mentioned inspiration there and, and storytelling. Talk to me a little bit about what inspired you to go in the direction of your career. You've, you've been at this for, for quite a while, it's software development, CRM. What, what, what actually brought you down that, that path? You know, I, I, there's a few things that I attribute my path to. I think one of the biggest ones is NASA. Uh, I think that, uh, NASA and Kennedy, who really set the tone for our nation to go to the moon and do those other things, as he so eloquently said, it really, um, paved the way for a lot of young people who were inspired by what man can do. And I say man by all, 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 all man, people. mankind. Yeah. Mankind. Yeah. And, um, and so watching the, the astronauts, uh, fly Mercury and then Gemini and then Apollo and the space shuttle certainly was all inspiring. And my mom took me to New York one time. And do you remember the Pan Am building? Sure. So the Pan Am building is now the MetLife building, but it's an iconic building in the center of, I think, Park Avenue or, or one of those streets. And in the lobby, when I was nine years old, there was a IBM teletype uh, uh, terminal there, and it had uh, Alyssa running on it, which was a uh, AI Lisp written program that can interact in a human fashion. And so they let you touch it. And I went and played with it. And it said, hi, John, how are you doing? And I answered the questions and interacted in a very human way. And I was just really inspired by what the potential of computers were. And this was 1969 or so. And then my uncle helped invent radar and microwave at MIT in the 40s and was an aerospace entrepreneur and president of IEEE. And he helped inspire me in technology. And you know, I don't think I'd be here today without my father, who was the number one Lincoln Mercury guy in the 50s and first Subaru dealership in California in the 70s. All of these things blended into me pursuing computer science, me working in a computer store to pay for my degree, and me digesting all of the knowledge of the adoption of microcomputers. I sold the first 300,000 IBM PCs to Southern California corporations when there were just terminals on the desktop. So imagine the knowledge that I digested of the adoption of microcomputers and software and the evolution of networks and client-server computing. And all of this really set me up to solving my problem, which turned out to be the world's problem, which is how do you manage relationships at scale as a team? Mm -hmm. And and the, 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 the thing there is... This is really bigger than, than CRM because CRM is a database for managing prospects and customers by sales and marketing people, but it's not just sales and marketing people that touch the, com- the, the constituency around your company. And so for a company to effectively scale engagement with its con- community around it, you need a team contact platform for the whole company. And that's really what we set out to build with Goldmine but he, it basically was Outlook and Salesforce before either existed. And the heart of it was relationships and contact management. And I really think that that's still the problem that we all suffer from today. Yeah, well, no doubt. I mean, this is this is the perennial problem, uh, particularly on social media. And there's there's that legendary number of, of you know, the 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 mythical 150. It's uh, Dunbar, the Dunbar number. That's the one that you, you can't really have or upkeep relationships once you get beyond that circle of 150 connections. Um, no. And, and the problem is, is that if you do what they teach you to do and we teach this to build your brand and grow your network, you need to set yourself up as a trusted advisor to stay top of mind with your prospects, customers, and influencers by giving your knowledge away or giving other people's knowledge away in and around the promise of your products and services. So if you do that effectively and then listen and engage with the intent to grow others, you're going to have so many connections you won't be able to manage them. Right, right. And and that's the ultimate challenge. I mean, I, I see so many people, particularly in the influencer space, who are talking about you know growing their their follower base 
And and there's so many scams that people buy into that, you know, bots that will boost your numbers or uh, followers that you can buy. And I, I think you, you keyed in on it when you, you talked about the development of Goldmine. It's really about relationships. So can you can you talk a little bit about the importance of relationships concurrent with the importance of growth? Well, let, let's talk about relationships for a second. My dad was the relationship guy. He would stop and talk to anybody at any place. And as a kid, it bothered me, right? It's like, dad, tugging on his jacket, dad. <laughs> and, and, and I've become my father um, because I truly believe that the best gift you can give to another human being is your presence. And, and that means if you're in the, in, in the, sh- in the grocery checkout place, instead of staring at your phone and ignoring this person who's serving you and putting themselves in danger by engaging with all these people that go through the checkout line, you know what? Look them in the eye. Ask them how they're doing. Give them the gift of your smile. And I think that, um, there's energy exchange when you're actually present with another human being. Take the time to, interact with them to the point where there is a connection there. I think that as human beings, we feed off that. And so I really do believe that humans really benefit from interacting with other humans. But what's the purpose? Is the purpose just to get a, a boost in energy because you connect with somebody? No. It's it's really, what is your purpose on this planet? And I came to that sort of realization after I sold gold mine and I I um, I I got a head tumor and I almost died and going through the healing process of dealing with that tumor and also the, the spiritual work that I did after it, I came to the conclusion that my purpose on this planet is to grow my soul. And the best way to do that is to help other people grow theirs. And I know that sounds kind of spiritual and all that, but it really is. We're only on this planet, a blink of an eye. And if your purpose on this planet is to make as much money as you can, I think you're missing out on really the opportunity. I think that life isn't about making money. It's about making memories out of moments. And they don't write on your grave, you know, invented serum and made tons. They say, beloved father, friend, husband. And I think that if you can, instead of like sales being all about how much you can get from somebody, I think it should be about how much you can give to somebody. So mm. I think we need to be the we generation than the me generation. It should be about serving, not selling. And I think that if you change your perspective of why you're interacting with other people is not to get, but to give, you could transform your life by helping transform others. I love that, John. I, it's it really, that's, that's the essential of, of leadership when you think about it. It's service. It, it, it's not recognition or fame. True leaders, the ones that are doing what they do, it, they're doing it because they love to give back. They love to give to others. They love to develop others. And in, in, in a certain way, when you think about the younger generation coming up that's trying to make their mark, that's trying to stand out, it's awfully tempting to think about yourself first. And the, the way you've positioned it there is to, you know, that, that we think about each other and we, we all come to this together. But isn't that, isn't it a bit of a challenge for uh, folks right now that it's, it's almost like waiting for someone to blink? Like you're, you're waiting for the other side to make the move first before you become the vulnerable one and, and put yourself out there and take a risk of giving to others with maybe no expectation of receiving something in return? I don't think so. I, I, you know, we, we had a, we had a, a, uh, a dinner party last night where, uh, we invited some local artists who can sell their wares in our home and we fed people and, um, it was really nice gathering, but there was this one gentleman that came in the room and his presence just put me at ease Hmm. and he just had this energy Scott, honestly, kind of like yours, where I didn't feel like he wanted anything from me, but he was just giving his presence and calmness. And I think that when you are vulnerable in front of other people, it makes it easy for them to connect to you. And if you can get another human being to connect with you, 
then you can develop the intimacy and trust that you need in order to learn enough about that person to blow some wind in their sails. And if you can do that at scale, that's how you can transform and reach your dreams. I mean, you just go through history, Dale Carnegie, Zig Ziglar, they take the same thing. The more people you have grow, the more you will grow. And I actually have an example of that. When I was a young man in high school, I loved to play chess. And um, I would teach other people how to play chess. And did you know, Scott, I actually learned how to play chess better by teaching other people how to do it. Interesting. And I think there's a, there's a secret there that, that that's really the, the essence of, I think, the message I'm trying to get across today is if you want to reach your dreams in life, if you could help other people reach their dreams in life at scale, then your dreams will be fulfilled. And honestly, this is why I was able to grow Goldmine out of an apartment on, on no investor capital, no VC, no bank loans, into a company that uh, pioneered CRM and contact management before Outlook or Salesforce existed. And it was really all about solving people's needs to manage relationships at scale. And um, I think that is the secret, is is being vulnerable and connecting with others, finding ways to help them grow at scale and the world unfold. Hmm. I like that. John, you you mentioned starting Goldmine out of your apartment. I would imagine there are some valuable lessons that you learned in that in that first go around as an entrepreneur, lessons that helped you grow as a leader, maybe some mistakes that you made, maybe some successes that you wanted to repeat. What are, what are some of the, the nuggets that you can pull out for us? Well, I, I think that some of the biggest nuggets are how do you take a product that nobody knows they need? Because networks just started happening. There were no network business applications, let alone CRM. So how do you connect with SMBs at scale, small businesses, and teach them why they need a team contact platform for their Novell network that they recently bought to hook up their printers and hard drives. Well, there's a, well, what I did was I contacted the influencer of the small business, the person that sold them the network, the Novell reseller, because there was no Microsoft network at the time. So Novell was it uh, for the SMB. And I got them to use it because people sell what they know and they know what they use. And they started to recommend it and resell it to their customers. And Scott, I transformed these Novell resellers from selling plumbing to plumbers, selling uh, IT infrastructure to IT decision makers, selling the highway, uh, the operating system and printers and hard drives to selling business solutions on top. So instead of making a dollar, they were making $10 of extra products and services by selling uh, gold mine and the consulting services that went with that. But then what happened was Microsoft came out and they ate Novell. So Microsoft doesn't innovate, they iterate. They wait for someone else to build the market, then they come in and it's big enough with their muscle, which is billions of users and hundreds of thousands of ours. They hired my former boss at Banyan Vines and he built NT Server and then they built SQL Server and Exchange Server and they wanted to sell it to SMBs. No SMB is going to buy SQL Server, a, a database, without an application that calls for it. So what we did was we built Goldmine Enterprise, which required a seed of NT Server, SQL Server, and Exchange Server for every seed of Goldmine, which helped our customers scale to millions of records in their databases and have a more secure operating system and email transport, helped the reseller sell $10 in every Goldmine dollar, but more importantly, it helped Microsoft sell their crown jewels. So our third-party solution drove the adoption of the first-party solution, and they just pushed us worldwide. And so if you can help other people grow at scale, you will grow. We transformed the Novell reseller from selling operating systems to selling business solutions. We transformed our customers from trying to manage contacts and, 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 and relationships with spreadsheets into a, a database that ran across not just their corporate office, but their district and field sales notebooks. And we transformed Microsoft, helping them sell their business solutions. And this just gets back to the exact same thing that we've been talking about is by helping other people grow, you will grow. Yeah. And you know what strikes me about that that story there about the, the founding of Goldmine and how you, you worked your way up to Microsoft is you didn't you didn't set your sights on Microsoft right out of the gate. 
I mean, you had a very specific target audience. It was SMBs. It was uh, Novell servers. Um, I, I, I can't even begin to repeat all the technical uh, stuff that you, you mentioned there, John. But what I got from it is you eventually were able to land a client like Microsoft or to become important to a client like Microsoft because of the help that you 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 had for other clients farther down the chain and how you helped them grow and it, it's actually kind of a uh, a reverse mechanism you talk about uh, trickle down economics this is trickle up uh growth so i i think that that's wonderful to see that kind of uh, success out of a uh, out of the gate well what it what it is is you need to be present enough to listen to your constituency and i didn't say customer on purpose because it's mm. not just prospects and customers that grow your business. At Goldmine and Nimble, we connect to editors, analysts, bloggers, influencers, third-party developers, investors, advisors, and prospects and customers. So you need to be listening and engaging with your constituency in order to sense the needs and opportunities that you can dance from. So it's, it's one of the reasons why I named Nimble Nimble because I so admired Fred Astaire and his ability to just – flow through these dances, right? And so you need to sort of see your business and life as a dance. You can't be rigid in it. You need to flow like a river as, as the rocks are there. You don't bump into the rocks. You just sort of flow around them. And so you need to be present enough to be able to sense the need of your customers needing to scale and have a better database. Your resellers needing to sell additional services on top. And Microsoft's need to sell their solutions and then put that together but it's exactly the same thing that caused me to synthesize CRM and contact management when I struggled with managing leads and contacts as a field seller in a district office for an enterprise software company. And that's when I synthesized the idea of uh, integrating email, contact calendar, and sales and market automation into a team uh, uh network uh, business application. Yeah. But one of the things I do want to talk about is – growing the team. So I think that the most crucial thing you could do as an entrepreneur is to grow the people around you. And um, it is the best reward. Uh, I think that when I'm stopped on the street by people that were involved in the goldmine community or even the nimble community and not just the past team members, so I don't call them employees, um, it, it really moves me in my life because I think, again, that's why we're on this planet is to grow others, and that's how you grow. And we would hire, instead of hiring, say, business degrees or computer science degrees, I loved hiring liberal arts majors because they were taught how to research, read, and write, and communicate. And in many cases, they're, they're really the, the people that are last thought of by technology people to hire – but I love them because they can learn and you can teach them anything. And then when you transform their lives by letting, getting them the opportunity to start and growing them through their career, it's, um, it, it, it becomes this culture that gets created in your company that's unstoppable. So, uh, one person I'll point out is, uh, Natalie Burdick, who started, um, uh, at Goldmine, uh, as a graduate for UCLA in history. And eventually uh, became VP of product. And uh, and this example just continues. We hired hairdressers who became uh, head of channels and, uh, and other things like that. And so I think that the job of a leader is to set the vision um, and the path, hire intelligent people, train them well, empower them to make decisions in the face of the customer and then make sure that they have the tools and the resources they need to be successful and that they're constantly growing. And, um, and that's really the secret to gold mine and nimble success. Boy, uh, there is so much to unpack there, John. So John, one of the things you mentioned there, which obviously appeals to me as a former classics major is, uh, bringing in non-technical people, liberal arts people, um, folks that understand history, that understand writing, good communication, critical thought, listening skills. I mean, these are really all aspects of leaders uh, that are that are necessary. And as you've built your teams out, 
and you've had these liberal arts people, you've had your technical people. Do you find that it's more difficult to grow one subset of those people over another or that different forms of growth are needed for each team? How, how do you approach that? Well, I, I, I think that individuals are so unique, right? We're the, if you've been around the world long enough, you know that there's a broad spectrum of chemical, emotional makeup of human beings. And so I think that you need to be sensitive about who somebody is, where they've been, where they want to go, and make sure they're in the right spot with the right tools uh, necessary for their success. Um, not everybody's going to be Lewis and Clark. Somebody needs to follow Lewis and Clark with the wagons and uh, build the towns and build the railroads and uh, run the shops. And, you know, it takes, <laughs> dare I say, a village <laughs> uh, <laughs> to, to, to make uh, dreams come true. And so I think that uh, as a leader, you need to be sensitive to the differences of the individuals on your team and put them in places where they can succeed. Because I think that in many cases, when a team member doesn't succeed, it's less their fault than yours. And I think that having the right onboarding, the right training, the right feedback mechanisms are so critical, especially in the remote world that we live in today. Um, I think it's even more important to be aware of that. So, so that valuable resource, like the human capital is the most important capital that you have in your company. Mm. And, um, and I think that if you can truly be sensitive and aware and present and um, and be doing everything that you can to grow those human beings into future leaders who can grow others. That's how you truly scale. Yeah, you know, um, ironically, one of the the best sources I've found for leadership of late is both seasons of Ted Lasso. Um, what a what a wonderful show! Not only about uh, teams working together. Um, but what leaders need and, and what employees need, quite frankly. And there was a, there was a quote in there by the guy who is the, uh, the director of football operations. Uh, he said, a, a good manager or a good mentor hopes that you will move on. A great mentor knows that you will. And when you're working on that human capital, when you're developing that team, when you're giving them the tools they need to grow, whether it's within your company or eventually outside your company, if there is no more capacity for them to uh, to grow within, um, you, you really know you've you've achieved what you set out to do, even though it means potentially losing a team member, doesn't it? Exactly, Scott. And in fact, I've often said that in interviews is – your job as a leader is to grow the team to the point where they fly away. And I think there's nothing more illustrative of that than the metamorphosis of a, of a caterpillar. Uh, have you ever seen um, a caterpillar cocoon in the midst of their metamorphosis? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So, so we have monarch butterflies here. I don't know if you have them in your area. We sure do. And um, and so my wife plants milk thistle in our garden. She's a landscape designer, horticulture therapist, amongst many other things, ceramic artist. She, she beautifies my life, if you haven't heard me go on, wax profanely, wax on about her. Um, but she took me out in the garden one day, and she showed me this uh, butter, this caterpillar on our milk thistle and I, she said I plant this in order to attract the caterpillars who eat the aphids so I don't have to spray the garden and I started thinking about what a sustainable garden that she's building and how that applies to to us as human beings and to businesses so what we do uh, 
we teach people to plant things in your garden, right, in your social media that will attract the right people in order to create the right environment for growth and opportunity. And it, so a sustainable garden is a model of what you need to do personally in order to attract the right constituency in order for you to you achieve your dreams by helping them achieve theirs and a business as well. And I, I just love um, those sort of analogies that you start talking about. And I think when we start talking about transforming the um, your team members, it's not just your team members, right? It's really everyone around you. Um, and I can't tell you uh, how many people that I admire in this world who I knew in their early days and actually helped mentor. I, I'm not going to name names, but you know many of them. And uh, and I, I took the time on weekends to call them up or to take calls from them and to uh, find ways to add value. And um, I think that's really been the secret of success of, of Nimble's brand in that I think that people really get what we're trying to do is focus on the R in, in CRM for relationships. If you think about most CRMs are really about sales, pounding people till they buy or die. And I think that CRM has lost its way in regards to the value of relationships and the importance of them. And, uh, and I think that that message resonates with others and it's why they then tell our story. And it's more powerful when other people talk about you than when you talk about you. And we've just been blessed at, at Nimble to have so many wonderful human beings that our, our vision resonates with them. And then they go out and, and tell others. And I think that that's really another sort of secret of ours is, is we're not here just to grow ourselves. We're here to grow all the people around us. And what's more important than helping somebody build their brand, nurture the network in order to for them to connect with others at scale so that they can then achieve their dreams by helping other people achieve their dreams. It's fantastic. I mean it, it, it makes so much sense when you when you simply state it like that, John. I, I, I love that analogy that you made observing your your wife's garden and the sustainability there and it really it comes to down to creating a culture you know creating this kind of shared experience throughout all of your constituencies and obviously you want to make sure there's a a consistent con culture within your team and sometimes you can flag someone who clearly is not going to get on board who is not going to adapt and grow the way that perhaps the team needs them to and in some cases, maybe with the customer, maybe they have difficulty wrapping their minds around some of this stuff. And how do you overcome some of those resistors to growth or to development when you're when you're leading people? Well, I I sort of slip back to that old analogy: hire slowly, fire fast. And I wish I could do it because <laughs> I'm set. I'm set to softy. Um, but I think that you know when something's not a fit. Like, I think that we as human beings are keenly aware, but sometimes we don't listen to our inner voice. And I think it's important to listen to that inner voice that you have uh, because it's really God's gift to you. And I think, I think most people have it. Some people have it more. Um, and I think it's important for you to recognize when something's not going to work out and to make that hard call. And so maybe for some people, our application doesn't fit for, for the person. And you know what? Tell them before they buy. Because if you are straight with a person and you make a recommendation that's in their favor, even if it means recommending somebody else's product, that person's going to become an evangelist for you, even though they didn't buy themselves. Mm. And, and if a team member isn't fitting at your organization, uh, the best thing you could do is to help them find a place that's better for them. And uh, the last thing in the world you want to do is to, is to let them continue to struggle where they're not succeeding uh, and or delivering what you need them to deliver. And so I think leadership 
means making hard choices and being clear. Yeah. And, and odds are, if you've, if you've hired the right way, even if the person isn't the right fit or isn't finding their way, they, they aren't going to be a complete jerk. I mean, they're, they're going to understand that they're not fitting in as well. And it's, it becomes a mutual realization. And I think they will respond with, hopefully with grace, with gratitude to the leader who is helping them find a place where they may be better suited. Grace and gratitude. Amen. Easy to say, hard to practice, like, like growth, all these GR words. It's not easy. It, it takes it takes a level of commitment uh, to know that we want to move in a certain direction. I mean, it's, it's so easy to just remain rooted in what we know and what we're comfortable with. And, and the leader's job is to push the boundaries there and to help people, well, I guess, continue to adapt along the way and help them understand that it's okay. And I, you know, I guess there, there are a lot of leaders are also ex experiencing the same level of, oh, I don't know, uncertainty or anxiety as they're growing concurrently with the team. It, it's not like one is growing and the other isn't. And there are some areas where we simply don't have a roadmap. And what we do have in these circumstances is each other and the ability to encourage each other, the ability to uh, help each other grow along the way. Uh, can you talk a little bit about what you as a leader have gained from uh, the people? Uh, it, 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 you, you know, you talk about this, this kind of virtuous cycle of growth. Talk about some of the growth that you've gotten from the people that you've helped to grow. Well, I think that it softened my soul, Scott. Um, I think that uh, as a young person, I was gifted to be in the right place at the right time in the evolution of microcomputers and software and uh, their adoption. And, uh, and I've been successful in so many things I've endeavored to do that I think there's been points in my life that I was a little cocky. I mean, I'm just going to be honest with you. I mean, I was just confident and um, I don't seem to the point of arrogance, but definitely sure of myself to a certain extent. And um, I think that uh, through various moments in my life in trials of health and business and finances that you inevitably go through as an adult, I think that my, my, my heart and soul have been softened. And I think that the universe has a way of polishing you <laughs> or crushing you, uh, <laughs> depending on how you react to its lessons, right? Like the universe will come out and smack you and you can either wake up and go, okay, or, you know, ignore it and then smack you harder. So I think that, um, I think that, uh, going through the the paths I've been in in life have made me a more present person with a softer soul that enables me to listen more and connect deeper with others. Mm. And um, and I and I think that I'll give you an example of a of a of a trial that I went through, right? So we basically pioneered social serum and social selling by getting LinkedIn to give us their public and private APIs that they didn't give to anybody. And we essentially built uh, an amazing social serum for social selling and pioneered that category until LinkedIn took the API away. And, um, and about the same time, Facebook took their API away because they wanted you to go to Facebook to consume their advertising. And we had to sort of shift where we started out as a layer on top of G Suite uh, with social, we had to find a, a new path. And this was about the time that Microsoft came out with Microsoft 365. And because I saw Microsoft eat Novell back in the goldmine days, I knew that Microsoft would eat G Suite, now Google Workspace. And so we were able to do that Fred Astaire dance thing where we started to build integrations with the product, relationships with the people, which gave us access to the programs that today Microsoft has signed up to be our global reseller. They're actually pushing Nimble as the simple serum for Microsoft 365 through all their global distributors and actually paying them 
to promote Nimble. And you might say, well, why would Microsoft do that? Because they have Dynamics CRM. Well, most of Microsoft's customers are SMBs. And um, and Dynamics is really great for the enterprise, but the resellers need to start selling business solutions on top of Microsoft 365, but they don't know how, just like the Novell resellers didn't know how to sell business solutions on top. And so by being present and aware enough to see the transformations out in front of us, we were able to shift our company to be focused on this emerging opportunity. And, um, and I don't think I, I don't think we would have seen that if we, A, didn't know history, B, didn't have uh, the ability to build relationships with the people to get us access to the programs that uh, gave us that opportunity. And uh, and Microsoft's not an easy company to navigate. I mean, I, I don't know, what is it, like 500,000 people, a million? I don't know how many people that work there. But it's kind of like a woolly mammoth beast where you can't just stick a spear in one part of it. You need, you need a group of people driving the, the mammoth into like a, a cul-de-sac or canyon. And it's like, so it's, but magic can happen when you build the relationships and learn what the needs are of that individual or that department. And I think that's actually another secret to influencer marketing, which we use to build nimble. And I'm going to leave it. Uh, I'm going to give you a simple formula that any business person or business can use to build their brand by telling stories and getting other people to tell those stories for them. And that is all you do is you walk out into the business river and listen in the places where your customers learn about how to be better, smarter, faster in the areas of promise of your products and services. In my instance, it's pound social sales and marketing, entrepreneurship, et cetera. And find the content creators that resonate with you and that audience and then begin to curate and share that hashtag in the category and attribute in the person's name. And eventually that influencer and their community will begin to interact with you. And rather than you trying to sell them something, you listen and learn enough to find ways to add value to that community and ideally the influencer themselves. And so I can't tell you how many phone calls I've had with influencers and social sales and marketing where I didn't start the call by telling them how great I am or how great uh, Nimble is, but by doing my homework, learning enough about them and their product and services, asking questions, and then just shutting up and letting them talk for 30 minutes or more. Yeah. And, and when you do that, people will fall in love with you and you'll learn enough to find a way to add value, you'll build the intimacy and trust that you need for them to open up to you and tell you these things. And then magic happens. And at the end of all that, they're going to say, hey, Scott, tell me a little bit about you and what you do. And you do. And then they become, you know, users, advisors, storytellers for you. And again, that is all centered on relationships. So it takes 60% of the fuel of... uh, the majority of fuel of a rocket to get into orbit, the majority of fuel of a car to get to 60 miles an hour, but to keep it in orbit, to keep it at that speed takes very little. So imagine the energy it takes to build, to initiate a relationship, but to maintain it really doesn't take as much. Do you remember the guy with the pencils and the plates at the circus where they, they're spinning the plates on the pencils? Oh, you ever sure. seen that routine? Absolutely. Yeah. How much work does it take to get a, plate on the top of the pencil a lot right (laughs) absolutely but but how much does it take to keep the plate spinning it's a nudge it's a little touch and so so for you to to i to build the relationships that you need to achieve your dreams it takes some work but to keep them going doesn't take as much because they remember you you're top of mind and that's why i think it's so important to pick up the phone sometimes so I got in the habit of calling people on their birthday and singing them happy birthday. And, um, you know, people love it. You know, I'm not that great a singer, but it's a human touch that really matters. There you go. You, you've nailed it right there. John, I, uh, I'm reminded of, of that birthday thing. There, there is a CEO out there 
who has, uh, gosh, I think he's got about nine, ten thousand employees in his, uh, in his company. I've, I've written about him in my newsletter before. Um, every day he sits down with a pile of birthday cards and makes them out to whoever's birthdays are coming up in the company. And everybody gets a personalized birthday card. Some nine thousand employees get a personalized birthday card from the CEO. And, it's one of these things that he happened into. It, 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 it happened by accident. You know, his door was open and somebody came just to uh, ask him a question and it happened to be their birthday. And he realized he was onto something. And yeah, it takes a concerted effort. But in the big picture, is writing a birthday card to an employee really that difficult? No. But the impact that it makes, the, the way that person feels recognized, that feels heard, and that's that's really what humans want the most. They want to be heard. They want to be acknowledged. Oh, they're 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 desperate. They're desperate to be seen, heard, liked, and loved. That's why I think that so many people are addicted to posting things and looking for those little red lights. Uh, and you know, because they they just want to be seen and heard. And that's why I think it's so important for all of us to be more present with the people around us to listen, to learn, to find ways to add value, even if it means a moment of your presence and uh, and a smile for that person, to let them know that another human being sees them. And I think that when you do that and then they, they come back to you with a smile back at you, that's the energy of the magic of, of life, right? That, that sort of human connection that... Um, I think we actually feed on. Do, do you ever feel energy, Scott, from an interaction with another, another human being? Oh, gosh, all the time. All the time, John. As a matter of fact, my um, first season of uh, the Timeless Leadership podcast here, we had Harry Cohen on. And Harry teaches about heliotropic leadership. He, he's written a book called Be the Sun, Not the Salt. And the idea mm. here is that uh, sunflowers, if you ever watch a sunflower, um, as the sun comes out, the sunflower will track the sun across the sky. The sunflower will actually turn. And he said, that's what we as human beings do. We turn toward people who are warm, who give off a certain vibe. And we turn away mm-hmm. from people who give off the opposite kind of vibe. We, we tend to want to spend more time with great people that make us feel good. And we want to spend less time with people who make us feel bad about ourselves or who are constantly negative. So ab- absolutely. And, and, and that's what I mentioned earlier about this dinner party. When this person walked in, I immediately felt their energy and their presence. And uh, I love that old saying, people won't remember what you say. They'll remember how you made them feel. Of course, yeah. And, uh, and one of the things I like to say is, People don't buy great products. They buy better versions of themselves. Mm. Uh, Stop talking about your products and services. Start talking about how you can help other people become better, smarter, faster. There you go. And uh, and I think that's really the the secret to life. Back at the original thing is is stop selling. Start serving. Find ways to add value to others at scale. And, um, and that's really how you could build your own personal gold mine. Yeah. And, and look, it's so easy for us to, uh, to talk about ourselves. I want to give some other people a chance to talk here. We've got Brian up and then we've got Maria right after, uh, Brian. But, um, just before I bring you on, Brian, uh, it, it's so easy to talk about ourselves. It takes an effort to actually be interested in someone else, to do the research, to find out about someone else and to make them the star. But that effort is paid off. Uh, in in spades, I'm sure. Brian, welcome to Timeless Leadership. Oh, thank you for having me. I had to uh, I had to jump up and uh, raise my hand. Actually, just more of uh, validation for what John was sharing and what you were sharing, Scott. I I've been on the receiving end of uh, multiple uh, long phone calls where John and I uh, spoke uh, many many years ago. I was in a different job, a different role, uh, lived in a different state, actually. And I remember, uh, you know, vividly the, you know, conversations and mentorship and, and not only the idea that, you know, letting me talk, which everyone knows that is never a problem. Um, but, <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but John's like not only commitment to, you know, listening on that phone call, but, uh, you know, 
the, it's something, you know, Rachel and I, Rachel Miller, who I met when she worked for John originally, you know, we still talk about all of these years later, you know, eight years later, how committed John has always been to our success and not only our success, but, you know, the, the birthday messages and the, you know, continual nudges just to remind us that, you know, he's seeing what we're, what we have going on. And for me, that's like, that's leadership, you know, in not only in action, but it's also leadership in, you know, kind of the roles that's played. So I, I, I wanted to say you know, publicly, thank you, John, for that and, and kind of that wisdom. And, and that's all I got. Fanjo, that's so kind of you to, uh, to say, I, I've truly, um, enjoyed watching you blossom, uh, as a human being and how many people you teach and preach and inspire to. And, uh, you know, the funny thing is, is, uh, have a call or mentoring call with Rachel today at, uh, I think at five o'clock. <laughs> Now that's a small world. See how cool is that? Uh, Rachel worked yeah. for John, and then Rachel and I ended up doing a Google Hangout show uh, together for 330 episodes, and all that started through an influencer outreach that Rachel was doing on behalf of Nimble uh, way back when. So this was 2000, I think 13, 2014. So you know, not only is it is it proof, but it's been doing it for a long time. That's for sure. How timely! Thank you, Brian. Well, thank you, Brian, for uh, for joining us up here. It's always great to hear your voice. Uh, next up, we have uh, Maria, who's been waiting patiently. Maria, welcome to Timeless Leadership. Hi, thank you so much. I really appreciate you giving me a chance to ask my question. Thank you so much for sharing all the information that you're sharing and for um, just having this accessibility um, these days. It's really great to do this. So um, I have a question. I wanted to know if there was uh, a challenge in the beginning when you were first starting things that you might have had or that ways that you have uh, tips or something for people who are starting early about things. They're maybe a little too early. I always find myself a little too early. Um, and so I was just wondering if you have any tips about that because I do believe in the relationships, how the importance of the relationships and sharing knowledge and sharing um resources and, and things like that. But I find that uh, in my sharing, I just kind of uh, get stepped on and then other people have more resources or more money. And so then they can take whatever I've shared or the ideas and the things I'm um, trying to bring awareness to and do those things without me. So if there's any tips that you have for being like too early or, um, sorry, is that clear enough of a question? Thank you. Yeah, thank, thank you, you for that, Marie. You want to, you, you got the question, John? I think I do. Okay. Um, I, I think that Maria is innovating in her areas of passion and that she feels that sometimes when she shares her innovations with others in order to inspire and grow them, that other people might take her ideas and make them their own or, or, or maybe not, um, Maybe she just feels like people are taking advantage of her. And mm -hmm. I think there's a difference between being um, open with a service mentality to help other people grow in order for you to grow to letting people take advantage of you. And, um, and I, I, I went through moments of my early entrepreneurship where uh, people took advantage of me. I remember... Like I said, I sold the first 300,000 computers to Southern California corporations back when there were no PCs on desktops. And by the way, Scott, there was a 55% margin on IBM PCs in those days. So you can calculate the commission on that. Wow. But the company I worked for, they kind of messed with me about uh, what they owed me and, uh, and what they paid me. And uh, I think you need to you need to advocate for yourself in life and, and you need to know when people are taking advantage of you and, and speak up for yourself. And if they don't change, uh, you need to make a change of whatever sort that you need to do. So there's a difference between being a pay it forward relationship focused person who is growing by helping other people grow to being a person that you let people take advantage of, of you. And so, Maria, my advice to you is to work on your boundaries and um, and your inner strength in order to 
protect yourself while still being vulnerable and open, but not letting yourself be taken advantage of. Oh, that's great advice. What, what, any, any feedback on that, Maria? Uh, thank you so much for sharing that. Yes. Um, if I could just set one really quick example, I've been building community in the tech space since 2014. And, um, you know, a lot of people were interested in that. And at that time, and I would go to be companies and make a presentation, um, you know, and talk about how important it was to build relationships and community in the tech space. And literally after my te uh, presentation, they'll turn to somebody in the room and be like, that's a great idea. We'll hire you to do it, somebody else. And I would be like, but wouldn't you want the expert or somebody who's advising you to do these things? And they'd just be like, no, no, we'll figure it out. We'll figure it out. There's time. So thank you for sharing, um, you know, your your challenges and how to um, just think about it uh, differently and, and uh, your perspective. So I appreciate that. Thank you. You bet, Maria. And uh, I'd just like to add a little something you're probably better off having not worked with those people anyways, because um, life is too short and you shouldn't work with people that you don't respect and uh, who don't respect you as well. And so don't compromise your integrity or your heart or your soul by uh, spending time with people who don't value you or respect you in life. That's well, thank you so much. Great yeah. advice. Timeless advice there, uh, John. Um, we are uh, we're a little over the hour that we had planned. I, I know uh, recording-wise we're still under a little bit, so I uh, have a little bit more time here. Uh, Bob's been waiting patiently to uh, become a speaker. I know I invited him up to uh, help me with the, uh, the patter song while we were waiting for uh, connecting at the top of the show. But, uh, Bob, you've been very patient. Welcome to Timeless Leadership. Thanks for having me, Scott. Uh, John, thank you for all your information. Maria, great question, by the way. I appreciated that. Um, I, so I had, a th I had a thought while you were talking about teaching and learning and how, and how learn, uh, teaching something helps you become better at it. Um, and when you take that example, you combine it with your, ta with your information, John, um, about you know, I got the feeling that a culture of growth is extremely important to you in the organizations that you worked with and that you built. And so my question is, due to that fine line between teaching and learning and, and getting things done, do you feel that when you're when you're building a team of people, that it's more important that they have that mindset first, that growth mindset that you've been talking about, and then you can teach them the technical skills, or vice versa, they need to have those skills, and then you can teach them the growth mindset and maybe there's some nuance there but i thought that would be a good thing for you to talk about thanks bob i appreciate the question um it's a great question so what what what, what we look for in people is uh number one that they have a, a mind and a soul that is interested in learning and growing and uh and i say mind and soul because i do think that it's more than just the, the mental growth that somebody should be doing in, in life. Um, and that they're a good cultural fit in the organization. In regards to their knowledge about business or technology, I could teach an intelligent liberal arts person any, any business or technology skills that they need in order for them to contribute to an organization. But I can't remake a human being. I can't give them the knowledge that they ideally acquired through the years of academic studies about how to do critical thinking, research, writing. Uh, I can't remake their heart and soul that's been created through the life journey that they've already been on. And so what I look for is somebody who's a good cultural fit, Somebody who's, in, who's intelligent and has a strong desire to grow uh, their heart and soul. And I don't really worry about the business or technology acumen. In general, for mostly entry-level people, if I'm hiring on an engineering level or a senior role of leadership where they'll be leading others, of course I look for skill sets and experience in those areas. 
But um, I like to hire um, entry-level people and grow them into senior leadership positions. And I think that the, you know, most of our team at Nimble has been here for over seven, eight, nine years. And I think that's sort of a testimony to that mentality. That's great. Appreciate that. I, I love how you talked about the the length of time and there's lessons that they have to learn there, but it's really the, that experience that they've had prior to working for you that's extremely valuable. Yeah, I, I, I think that there's a journey that all human beings go through. It's like with the, you learn so much by your mom and your grandma, your dad, and then what you learn on the schoolyard and in the classroom. And it's really not even the academic stuff. It's like the stuff that you could and should and shouldn't do, you know? And it, that takes years of polishing. I Sometimes I feel like I was a lump of coal back in my earliest days. And the human being that I am is really a reflection of the people around me that have helped me to grow into who I am. Uh, and I can name a, a lot of teachers and even a lot of friends who have inspired me to become the person that I am. And, and, and I call that sort of polishing. So like, you know, you take coal and you crush it into a diamond. Um, I, I'm grateful for all of the people that I've interacted with that have polished my soul. And that actually includes Scott because, uh, Scott, you and I have interacted briefly over times in different places and moments from, for different reasons, but you've always, I've always come away with a smile on my face from those interactions. And I think it's a reflection of your heart and soul. And it inspires me to continue to polish mine. Oh, well, thank you so much for that, John. Very, very kind of you to say so. And hey, look, uh, I think we all start out as, as a lump of coal. Uh, hopefully not the kind that uh, kids, that naughty kids receive from Santa around Christmas time, but uh, we all start out unformed. And, uh, you know, diamonds come from coal under great pressure. Uh, and, it, you know, if you want to go the other way, uh, pearls are formed uh, by friction, you know, a piece of sand getting in between uh, the, the shells of an oyster. Uh, it, it, and, and another one is a sword. A sword is built by hammer, hammer and fire. There you go. There you go. And, and look, the, the point is none of these, none of these things happen without work. Uh, the work that someone decides to apply to something to make it into something better. So, John, thank you so much for helping us become something better. How, how can people find you other than your, your Twitter account here? Well, this is a, a tip that I love to give people. Google me. In fact, Google yourself. How do you show up? Are you are you comfortable with how you show up on that first page? Uh, and if you're not, go build a Wikipedia page for yourself uh, to start uh, controlling how people see and feel you. Um, but uh, you can Google me, John, J-O-N, space Ferrara, F-E-R-R-A, and you'll find the various identities that I uh, have put out there and connect with you on whatever identities you feel comfortable with or email me, j-o-n at nimble.com and let me know how I might be able to add some value to your journey. That's fantastic. Well, clearly, John, you have a lot to add and we thank you for being here and helping us add to our own journeys. Growth takes work. It comes from the time we invest in ourselves, and more importantly, in others. But like any hard work, it pays off, creating deeper relationships and dividends that we'll continue to enjoy. To grow is to live. Thank you for joining us and for being an advocate for timeless and principled leadership, whenever and wherever you find it. I'm Scott Monty. Until next time, May you dream more, learn more, do more, and become more, for you are a leader.